Welcome to the Creative Baggage Podcast. I'm your host, Serena, here with our producer, Justin, and we're here to unpack our creative baggage and talk about how we can make the world a better place for creatives. Today, we're excited to share our discussion with a very special guest. My name is Kimberly Lavon. I am a master creative and I'm located in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, I started as a uh, just drawing things. I started drawing portraits and started entering competitions at age seven. Didn't really do very well, so took a long break, shocker. And then at 12, I picked up the alto saxophone, played for 15 years. And during that time, I also started illustrating for my high school newspaper. I painted a few murals. I did a lot of different creative stuff. And then after high school, I started a tattoo artist apprenticeship I thought I was just going to kill it. It was going to be amazing. Making $150 an hour at 18, I was just like amazing. Like I need nothing else. Uh, That stopped because I found it just wasn't the right fit for me. So I went to college and got my undergrad in fine art printmaking and graphic design. And then I opened my own studio. I ran that for about 12 years and then went to grad school to get my master's in advertising in 2020. And then obviously the pandemic hit, things got weird. And then due to the new need, like a new normal per se, uh, creatives everywhere were like, I need help with all these things and I don't have any money and I don't know where to get it. And it's like, I can help you. Like there's grant funding, let's talk about it. And so that just turned into uh, opening Mint Maven, which is uh, fundraising for creative placemakers. And the mission is to get every creative everywhere funded to help them grow their businesses, uh, launch creative projects, and stay out of the starving artist dilemma. I love that. Um, And how did you learn? Because we talked, um, and something that stuck with me that you said was that there is a grant for everything. You were like, oh, you you need supplies. There's a grant for that. You had an emergency. There's a grant for that. You want to do this. You want to pay this person. There's a grant for that. How did you learn that that was the case? Like, we don't really know about that in school. And in, in my like head, grants are still this like mysterious thing that's like competitive and you have to win and you have to be the best to win. Like, how were you exposed to this world? And, and how did you gain that perspective? So in undergrad, I was funding everything myself. I didn't have uh, family support or like savings to speak of. So they just threw a bunch of paperwork at me and said, this thing is called a Pell Grant, fill this out and maybe you'll get money and like fill this other paperwork out and you can get a work study and all this stuff. And I was just filling out paperwork, you know, to get into the school and doing what they said. So I just did it without thinking. And then moving forward, It was always like, oh, well, if I I ever got stuck, I would just say, oh, well, there's probably a grant or something. And I would just kind of automatically go there. I didn't think of it as a thing that I could use to help other people or a long-term solution. It was just like, oh, okay. And then people would say things. So it kept happening that way, just kind of happenstance for years and years and years. And then when the pandemic hit, this boot camp uh, was opening and I really wanted to take it, but it was... $2,500 $2,500 and I didn't know what to do. So serendipitously, a friend in a financial space was like, hey, we're helping creative people like you, entrepreneurs. There's this opening for this grant. It's also a kind of a boot camp thing, but they will pay you. And I'm like, cool. And just more paperwork. And I just blindly <laughs> just filling it out, filling it out. So I got in, awesome. I learned all the things. They gave me the money and then I got into the boot camp. But when I got there, they said, what was your story? How did you get here? So I told them, I'm like, I graduated, I got stuck, pandemic, I didn't have any money, I got this grant. And they're like, whoa, 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 what's a grant? And I'm like, it's free money for, and they're like, you pay for this course for that? I'm like, well, yeah. And they were like, can anybody do that? And I was like, well, yeah, you totally can. And and then it just started this big, kind of like a wildfire of like every creative being like, first, what's a grant? How do I get one? And can you help me? And I was like, yeah, I totally can. So uh, I've been doing that now since January and just learning about grants. Like 
what you need, how to apply, like what's the best way to do it. That's when I found this like kind of treasure trove of like many kinds of grant funding. So one of the creative grants specifically said if you were experiencing a, a health emergency, like dental work or your studio was closing or whatever, this one particular grant was designed to help artists or creatives in emergencies and it listed all these ways. And I was like, oh, so if I had my need to get my wisdom teeth out and I can't pay my studio rent because I need to pay for dental work, you will pay for that? And it just said was, yeah. And that's when I was like, that's amazing. So what else can we do? How else can we help? And the more I looked into it, I found there's $72 billion as of this year that's open, up from $62 billion last year. And now with all this financial trouble, I'm sure that there'll be even more grants opening, which is even more money. And a lot of them just go by the wayside because people don't know that they exist. And because they're not applied for, the money just sits there. So it's like, if I can connect a community like our community to finances that are earmarked just for them and they don't even know about it, I, I can't wait to be like your own personal superhero. Oh, I love awesome. that. Again, there's such a perception out there that like grants are competitive and, and they are competitive. They can be hard to get, but also like I was not aware. I mean, you showed me the sheer amount of grants that are out there and I looked at them and I was like, no way. There's no way there's that many grants and that much money that is just being thrown at people and people aren't taking it or knowing that they can even do that. I feel like they, because of the competitive nature of it, that maybe that's why it's not better known. Uh, and to speak on the competitiveness, I found today that the stats changed from if you applied to five grants, you'd most likely get one to three. Now you have to apply to 10 to maybe get one. And that's how mm. more, much more competitive it's getting. But with knowing that upfront, it's going to be super easy to get us creative people set up. It's like, I want you to focus on what you do, not like endless piles of paperwork. Like I've been doing it for a long time. Let me be like your guide through the paperwork and let me help you get funding. So, yeah. I want to hear about the system because I think sometimes my biggest hesitation when I see any kind of grant or contest that I want to enter is like, it's not a replacement in terms of getting money for work because work, you know that when you put in the work, you get the returns on your work for contests and for grants where there is an element of competition to it. It's like you could potentially be doing all this work and get a lot of money for it, but you could also be putting in all this work and getting nothing on your return. So you talked about like the strategy of, you know, statistically, how many do you have to do, but what else, what other systems do you have in place to like, make sure that people are maximizing their efforts? I had built <clears throat> a proprietary system in Notion that makes the entire thing as simple as humanly possible. So it's three steps. The first one is gathering all the documents that you need, all the boring stuff, paperwork, letters of support, et cetera. We cover what you're missing. You give leave a tiny bit of homework. Uh, step two is to fill out these kind of templates that I've made, kind of like Mad Libs for creatives. Like I do this for these people and these people are happy because of whatever reason. So, uh, so that'll help with like bios and all the stuff like the heavy writing stuff that most people don't want to focus on that either. And then the simple final step is this custom database filled with like hundreds of thousands of open grant opportunities for every single creative specialty you could possibly think of. I research daily. My nickname is Lightspeed Levon. So I get stuff done pretty darn quick as well. And the whole thing is great because you can download the system afterwards. You can save it to your own Notion account. You can customize it. But the best part is that every single thing that you'll ever need for any grant moving forward is in this system. And if it's not there, we can make a note. Um, as grant things change, like people want videos and they want uh, pitch decks and all kinds of stuff, there's help in there. There's notes. There's books. Like It's a fully comprehensive system. And it made it as affordable as possible because I know how annoying it is 
to be stuck. Like, you know, you're awesome at what you do. You need to get to a show. You need to keep your doors open, whatever, but you don't have the money. And all these administrators, in my opinion, are like taking advantage of that. And like uh, these theaters would be empty if it wasn't for creatives. Concert halls would be empty if it wasn't for creatives. So it's like, we should keep that in mind first and realize that like, what we're doing, there's a huge benefit and a value to it. And if we're not receiving that value, something's not right because none of it would be happening without us. Yeah. Um, what are maybe some of the problems that you see with the way that grants are run now? Like now that you've helped so many people get them or apply for them and sometimes obviously not get them, like what how would you like the grant industry to change also? I'd like to see a better support for specifically creatives and women and any marginalized community, because as we know, many of these grants were created because of well-known needs to these people. And it's like, it almost feels like a buzzword at this point. Like, yeah, if you're a woman or a person of color or creative, oh well, yeah, you need this. It's like, well, why? Why is that the default? Like, why couldn't it be the default that we're all just killing it? That like creative is the profession <laughs> that you want all your kids to go into because we make so much money. Like, I, want, I, I love that. I, I just want to, I want to flip this upside down. Like I want, I feel like we're all living in the upside down, right? Like if, if anybody can just pick up a flute and play the most amazing song you've ever heard from never having picked it up before, then there'd be no reason to pay us. But you can't. Like, to find people to do what you do, it's highly rare. It's hard. You got to try and look and, you know. So uh, I think we should take our power back. We should take our power back by just realizing that we are the awesome that everybody's paying for. What we're kicking out is amazing and unique and not something that can be found on any shelf or just canned or replaced easily. And that because of that, we need more support. We need more funding. We need more spaces for us to exist. We need to be seen as not a subculture. And uh, we need more people telling us, like, from day one of art school or whatever it is you're doing, like, number one, you can get grant funding. Here's how. And then to help us, like, to support us through our journeys and not just be like, oh, I randomly found out about this, about this awesome thing that I could have been utilizing literally my whole life, but somebody tried to purposely keep it from me. That's what it kind of feels like, like the mm. best kept secret of creative, the creative industry almost. Yeah. And I think the other um, maybe psychological element of it too, is like, we've been told our whole lives, like I've always been asked, how are you going to make money doing this? Like, are you really serious about getting a degree? Like, and then, so then you kind of develop this, like, I'll show you mindset but sometimes I think the other side of that is that then you're afraid to ask for help because then it's like, well, if I'm asking for help, if I'm like looking for funding or or I need someone to guide me through how to do all these things, then like, what will people think? Like, will my parents think that I'm failing and, and I should switch majors or like, you know, there's a feeling of like, I have to do this on my own because... I, you know, I've gotten this far and, and all these people thought I couldn't do it. And I'm really proud of what I've done. Um, and, but then it, there's that stunted feeling of like, well, if I need to grow even more that I don't know if I should ask for help or if, does it make sense to, you know, get somebody like in any other industry, it's totally normal, you know, to have extra certifications, extra this, extra that. And then with music and art, a lot of the times it's like, oh no, you just have to like go off your own talent and figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I think that's totally wrong. I, it's, I feel like it's a tool. Like the, the big bad is, is that like this taunt mindset to not ask for help, to rely on yourself, like, exploiting imposter syndrome because they know that we have it. It's like, mm -hmm it's keeping us where we are, which is at square one. And so if, if I could, I don't know how to change that per se, aside from just kind of 
gently reminding every creative, like, you're amazing. You got this. You don't have to think that way. There's There are other ways. Like, ignore the canned speech that you've been told because it's it's a lie. It's It's been designed to keep you down. Ignore it. You can ask for help. You can get grants. You can get help. You can, everything that you need can be yours. Don't listen to that. Like, our professions are just as valid and needed as every other. So I get that changing a cultural shift perception and what we do is going to take, a, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of years because uh, the narrative has always been negative, but I'm willing to start doing that and do it until I no longer breathe because I'm so sick of watching so many creatives fail when all they needed was just to know they had options, to know they had support and to know where to get it. Hey, music friend, Heidi here from the Flute 360 podcast. As you may know, Flute 360 has been launching weekly episodes to the community since 2018. Because of the success that the show has brought my career, I wanted to offer the same success to you, the modern day musician. As a creative artist, you want to impact your community through your music and instruction. Wouldn't it be nice to have a piece of digital real estate where your ideal clients can flock to you? A podcast can bring awareness of who you are and amplify your voice and services. Go to HeidiKBegay.com and click Work with Heidi. Then click Shop. I'd love to also hear about, so you've done so many, like, pivots throughout your career. You've, you've done so many different things. What are some um, unique lessons that you've learned through switching um, so many crafts and, and, and developing so many skills that you think you might not have gotten the perspective for, or other people might not have the perspective for if they had stuck with one thing all the way through or two things all the way through? I think that... <clears throat> I feel like a lot of people uh, only stick with one thing forever and ever because they're afraid of the uh, jack of all trades, master of none thing. But if you really look into that mm. quote, that's only part of the quote. So I forget the whole quote, but it's, I think it's jack of all trades, a master of none is still better than a master of n- one or mm. something like that. It's the mm. whole quote means that, uh, let me let me get off the quote briefly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that every time I pivoted, somebody would say something like that: "Like you're starting over, you're abandoning all this stuff. Like, you know, are you really an expert? Or, you know, how long have you been doing this? All this stuff, all these questions, like trying to make me prove my value in whatever it was I was doing. So, to like you said, Serena, to you know, I'll show them kind of a thing." I took every single idea um, or avenue that I liked and I stretched it out for years. Like that I played the saxophone for 15 years. I professionally modeled for over 20 years. Like, every, and I started at like seven years old. And that's how my numbers are so big. Like I, I did it for that long just to prove like, okay, is this enough? Like, have I have I knocked off all your your checks and balances yet? Is is we have the, the time and the experience and the portfolio yeah. and the blah the blah the blah. And the minute and the minute they said yes, or I got some kind of like okay, it's like cool. And it was suddenly completely uninteresting. And I went on to yet another creative thing because yeah. again, light speed Laban. I was like, yeah, and, and I have a lot of creative interests. And I was like, hey, this kind of ties together, whatever. So if you're interested in doing that, I'd say do it. Uh the best or the easiest way to make that happen and make it make sense is to pick up something complimentary. So when I was a fine artist, I also picked up doing fine art printmaking because uh, fine art printmaking, I'm sorry, fine art framing. So the framing, as everybody knows, is fairly expensive. You can have like a postcard and it probably costs like 300 bucks to frame one thing. So I thought if I could frame my own art, I would save money and then I could drive it there myself and be like a one woman show. So 
Uh, I grew that business on the low low with printmaking in tandem because it made sense. As a advertising creative human, I was all excited to like make campaigns and help creatives and talk about music and art and all the things. And I found that the industry, like the culture just wasn't a good fit for me there. So just going out to creatives and trying to help them advertise, that's when Mint Maven kind of came, like the need arose. So I was like looking at my own history and going, oh my God, yeah, I have experience with this, like unknowingly. So that's where that other pivot came from. So basically if you're, the pivoting is easier if you do it within the same industry. So like Mm. all my pivots were creative. I didn't pivot from creative to like dentistry or being an attorney or something. (laughs) You know, it it was all in the same vein. So if you're going to do that, I would suggest the same, but also don't be afraid. If you want to say, screw it, I want to try something else. Totally do that because all of my professors, everybody, you get to a certain level and they make you take a sabbatical to make sure that you still like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so don't be afraid of that either. Like if you find you just need a break from being a creative person and you want to go break rocks, whatever, right? Just go (laughs) do it. Just do it. Just just like give yourself a timeline and be like, I'm going to try it out. And if it's not for me, I'm going to go back to what I like, but just whatever you do, just make sure you're happy. Like, do we need money to survive? Yes. Do we need shelter and food and whatever as humans? Obviously. But you don't have to do a bunch of stuff you don't want as a creative to be able to be a creative and make money. You can be happy mm. and have money and be a creative at the same time. It's totally possible. And I'm here to tell you it can happen. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> we amazing. creatives love to I mean, torture ourselves. Yeah. I feel That's like true. we do. <laughs> Why? It's like we have like two modes. We're yeah. we're like godlike creatures or we're total losers. And there's no in between, right? It's like the gray sure. area is a nice space for us. Yeah. Like it's like limbo, but it's cool. Like embrace it. Yeah. That's awesome. I feel like your story, like we talk so much about how like the windiness of career paths and how things really aren't a straight line and don't and shouldn't be and if you don't have that exploration and do all these different things like you don't really find your end goal and just doing things is often the catalyst for realizing that that's not exactly what you wanted to do and that it's like really an option to do that and it kind of you're chasing this thing that's kind of always moving and that's a very cool thing mm. thank you <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's amazing and it's also like it's just funny how much we feel like even within our within our career, it's like, oh, okay, it's this is not even about like we're creating we're choosing a creative career to make ourselves happy because we know that this is the thing that we have to do to be happy. And then within that, we have all these boundaries for ourselves like, oh, well, I chose this craft, so I can't try that and I can't try that and I can't like lose focus or I'll know like or else like the art won't be as like pure or like I won't be able to like make it when like the point of you going down this road in the first place was so that you could feel happy and fulfilled. So if you're outwardly rejecting all the things that are making you happy and fulfilled, then what are you doing this for? Exactly. Exactly. We get so (laughs) caught up with all those things that we, I don't think we even consider asking ourselves, do we like this? Do we want to keep doing this? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's like sometimes when you make one decision, you feel like it, you have to see it through in the original vision. But I think like a lot of our decisions are like the best decision for the moment of what options have surrounded you at that point in time. But as you go down the path, there will be more options and there will be more micro directions that you can go in within that larger, like, I knew I wanted, I think from a young age, I knew I wanted to do something creative and then music presented itself in the form of flute. And so then that's where I, you know, decided to major in and go to college for flute. And I still love it and I'm still doing it, but I'm realizing that a lot of, there were a lot of other things along the way that I also did enjoy and like I've brought them with me. And so now with creative baggage, like, you know, I like, I liked doing web design as a kid. 
Um, and so now I get to like work on our website and I get to do some of the entrepreneurial stuff that I had tendencies for that I didn't explore because I was just busy playing the flute. But now it's like, it didn't detract from my flute playing. Like I got, you know, my personal website up and running and then I was able to get flute students through that. So it, it actually like gives you the edge if you, if you bring along all the other things that you enjoyed along the way. Exactly. <clears throat> and that's why I, I feel like everybody should know that. Like when, when I think of my creative teachers growing up, it was like, they were really stringent on like super hyper focus, like practice as much as possible. You know, don't have a social life. I'm going to quiz you on this a billion times when you get back and you better get it all right. All, and it was just like fear and torture and like stuff that wasn't nice. And you choosing to like ignore that, me choosing to ignore that has made us and brought us to where we are today. And mm -hmm. because of that, we're able to help other creatives, which is awesome. So uh, I'm proud of us for being almost like trailblazers for creative people. I mean, cause I don't know many other people who, any other, many other creatives who are brave enough to let all of their creative interests come in at the same time and, and not let them go and not shut the door on them. So kudos to you, Serena. Thanks. Go team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the social life thing too, it's like, oh no, let's not have fun and make friends because we have to stay home and practice by ourselves. But actually like knowing people in the industry and having strong connections and relationships is probably one of the most important things. Yeah, that's literally like, everything. You can be as good <laughs> well, as you want, but the, if you don't know biggest, anyone. Yeah. Well, the biggest revelation to me is it's like, there's this whole idea of like, like, oh, like if you're serious, you're just doing your craft and you're just doing this. But like once you realize that like and and like I've always kind of hated the whole networking bro guy, like anyone who's like, oh, I love networking like that kind of feels weird and wrong to me when you're like trying to get things out of people. But the second I realized that, oh, if I just go out and meet people, have fun and just, you know, like pursue whatever thing, you know, people I find that are interesting and these experience like that's part of this. That's not like, oh, I should I should have been practicing. I should have been doing this other thing like that's equally as fulfilling to my career. And I don't even have to think about it. And it's just, I know that this is still important. Yeah. No, some people get called yeah. for gigs because they're fun to party with after. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Right? It's true. Like it's there true. are plenty of different reasons why you would call someone in for a gig. And like, that's definitely one of them. And, and <laughs> one of my teachers yes. told me like, you need two out of three things. And, and for like a musician, for example, it's, um, professionalism, like the talent and skill and being likable. And if you just have two out of the three, like you show up on time and you're likable. If you're not as good as those other people, like most of the time people don't care. Or if you're like that talented and people like you, if you're late, sometimes people usually don't mind, but you have to have two out of the three. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. I totally agree. And I've seen it countless times. It's like, how many times have you work with somebody or you met, you knew somebody who was just amazing at what they do. Just like you're drooling. You're just like mind blown. You can't wait to meet them and you do. And they're just jerks. They're just like, <laughs> you know, toxic waste dumps. And you're just like, oh, <laughs> you know, and, and then you question, you're like, do you want to want to continue to patronize this person's creative awesome? Because they're kind of jerks. And you like wrestle with yourself. Like, I don't want to wrestle with that. Like Serena, nice talented makes awesome music right like fun in many like fun for my ears and fun in person like why would you not <laughs> <laughs> yeah no because that's the thing too is like there are so many creatives out there and we're <gasps> all so talented and so good at what we do so like sometimes what makes the difference is if someone likes you or like has a connection with you feels compelled by what you say or what you do um, and that's part of it too. Like, I think we, we can separate ourselves from our, our, to a certain degree and it's healthy to do that. But there is that feeling of like, yeah, my art is in ways a representation of myself and I am in ways representation of my art. 
Absolutely. Oh, got super deep there. I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do on Creative Baggage. <laughs> I love Creative Baggage. <laughs> I'm like, forget, it, forget. It. That was that was like show. That, that was like jingle me. That was like advertising brain, like creative baggage jingle music, you know, kind of thing. That was version one. So please don't, uh, audience, please don't um, judge me too harshly. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun this episode. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> 